Meg Tyler is from Hopkinton, Massachusetts. She is poet and chair of Institute for Irish Culture at Boston University. She is a 2016 Fulbright Professor of Anglophone Irish Writing at Seamus Heaney Center for Poetry at Queen's University in Belfast, and she is soon on her way over there for her Fulbright work. She is author of a book on Seamus Heaney, A Singing Contest, which was published in 2005 and her poems and prose have been published in many journals, and she is the author of chapbook of her poems titled Poor Earth. So with that, I would like to welcome Meg Tyler to come up and share some of her poetry and her experience with us. Winter in Mount Auburn Cemetery. The linen-colored light spreads through the great mortified fingers of the European beach. When what has been given away does not return, light reflects from the gravestones as if they were stars. Think of all the people this landscape has taken into its mouth and held like wafers of dust. And yet it aches with want, like people gone blind. But in this pain there is silence, occasional flutter of blackbirds, the sky an exacting shell of blue. So when my daughter was three and four, I lived in in Paris with her. Um, We were both scrambling to learn the language. Um, The the preschool there was called the Ecole Maternelle. And I love that idea, school for mothers, I translated it as in my very clumsy French, the Echo Maternelle. And in this poem, there are some lines from um, Simone Weil, and so I hope you'll be able to hear those italicized lines, even though I don't want to do this with my fingers, because I don't like to do that with my fingers. All right, Echo Maternelle, reading Simone Weil and feeling dangerously heightened, I wait for my child in the dreary stone courtyard of Saint Marie. The beautiful French mothers make me think first of the way Vi starved herself, then of the silky and pliant irides that now hem the garden. I am as familiar with the barrier that exists between me and them as I am with the shape of the fingers that hold my book. Affliction is a marvel of divine technique. None of the mother smiles back at my dim bulb smile. Like a butterfly pinned alive into an album, she writes, we always want to love. A bell rings and the children bang open the doors, chattering, released from good behavior. My straggly-haired daughter's eyes bright with the fear that I won't be there. I am always there. I ask her what she did today. I played with yucky stuff. What? I ask again. She answers the same. I begin to press through the impeccably dressed children and their mothers to speak in my splintered French to Madame Brasson. Then I hear my girl call to a passing playmate, Au revoir, yucky stuff. (laughs) It is only necessary to know that love is a direction, not a state of the soul. If one is unaware of this, one falls into despair at the first onslaught of affliction. I look up and smile into the unsmiling eyes of the mother of Jean Christophe. Yucky stuff. So my my daughter's father died when um, I was pregnant with her, so a lot of the poems in Poor Earth, I guess, waft around that that subject. And I hadn't written about it in a long time until a a year ago, and, and I wrote this poem, Sentry. I see you with your hand in hers, and imagine myself walking in the shadows behind you both. I am no longer looking for the one I lost. 
He is so much younger than I am now. We would have little in common except that is his daughter in her bloom. He would weep glass if he saw her. So many years later, I don't blame him. I don't think he really knew he was leaving. He was just trying to get through to the next hour or minute. And one way to do that was to take a trip in the air. My Icarus, my fallen angel. How could he have known that I would keep the baby in my sight for hours and then years? That I would try to tend to her as if to a bed of first prize roses, safeguard each unfurling leaf, polish each incipient thorn, stand amazed at the strength of her blossom, listen with bent head to her voice of crushed rubies. She just turned 21. Aww. And she's had enough of my poetry, and that's why she didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is called After Blake, William Blake. Little star, how softly you shine. The cicadas have quieted. The air is taut, clear, and cool. Leaves of the oak crispen in the shadows. Small tear of light in the night's dark fabric. I can hear your bright singing, righteous and clean. You have freed the winged creatures from my heart. The flapping of their feathers, the last sound before sleep. Uh, this is a, a poem about the in part about the Irish um, painter and fisherman, um, Alfred Wallace, who lived in Cornwall. And um, on his grave, his friends who were artists made this beautiful tiled headstone for him, depicting a lighthouse that he had painted and, and a ship at sea. And the epigraph to this is from Marian Moore, the sea has nothing to give but a well-excavated grave. In Cornwall, what you first see are the chimney stacks, the moss-covered roofs, and then the crosses on top of the gravestones, which move up and down with your head as you climb the path. The seagulls now closer than the harbor at St. Ives. What draws you here is not so much what you can see as what you are able to. I have never seen eyes like yours never looked into such a glittering. The way you look makes me want, like the sea, to let something in and let something out. <laughs> you find the mariner's grave. The soft sheen of the tiles makes the day's gray light tilt and falter till the sun breaks through and the lighthouse expands on the surface of the gravestone. Alfred Wallace, was good with his hands and good with his eyes. His two-masted ship stretches casually, perilously toward the lighthouse, which in turn leans in its direction. Like I, I leaned into you that first night in the streets of Boston, taking measure of our steps, wondering if you were a haven, drawn toward you in a storm of images unknown to me. How was it your presence became immediately familiar, like brush and hook to Wallace? The gravestone darkens at its base, lightens at its top, like consciousness, like your voice, even when you are not speaking. So I'm going to read you a little poem. It's not little. I usually write little poems. This is the longest one, but please don't panic about that because in the larger scheme of things, it's not really that long. Um, it's called To the Lord Mayor of Belfast. And I just love that title. I, I would like to be called the Lord Mayor. It it's never going to happen. But what a wonderful thing. Lord Mayor, can I have a word? So to the Lord Mayor of Belfast. And they wear these great golden chains and amulets. They look like rap stars. All the Lord Mayors in Ireland. 
All right. Um, the last few lines of this poem come from Sappho, so I hope you'll hear the difference there too, the, the Greek lyric poet. To the Lord Mayor of Belfast. I ran through your town, down the diagonal paths between patches of green in your botanic gardens, the hyacinths at first a blurred purple before their scent caught. I ran by your river login down a cement path on the Strandmillis embankment, a rusting railing through which some wind blew, then trash, the water hastening inland, blackbirds unseen. I ran by your cars with the steering wheel on the right, your Dunn store, your Chinese welcome center, heard the bright den of the school playground, saw between hedges gray wool stockings and jumpers as children strove at recess in a ring. Up through the gardens again as if drawn by the hedgerows, I ran past a man in green trousers pulling at the earth. Behind the roses was the protruding back of the Ulster Museum, oozing as if from a dough press. As I ran, I was not thinking of trouble or art, not thinking of the elegant Georgian frontispiece I hadn't seen, the Doric columns at attention. I ran past the Lyric Theater, where later I would sit with the great poet's brother, who knit his fingers together and threw his head back to laugh ghosts come striding into their spring stations. I ran through the drift of his white hair to the Malone Road and Osborne Gardens where Michael and Edna abide in a house lit with triptychs of their daughter's painted gardens. Then back toward the Logan, I ran down my ardor. I ran down what I couldn't understand as an intention to love. I ran through Belfast, around street corners now, bustling with workers. I ran past the bus station, the Europa Hotel, where as a boy he had been blown off his feet. I ran past the Ulster Hall, the fish and chips man with his splash of red hair and level gaze, past the boots, past the queues of taxis. I ran past the broken windows, past St. George's Market, where they laid the bodies and then the cabbages out. Then I ran to the other side of the loch, up toward Hollywood and open spaces. On my left, the beach with blue shells, cafes with the telegraph splayed open on their tables. I left them behind. I ran past the shadow of what could be, glancing across the deep green of the field, the gorse on fire above it. I ran along the banks of Hawthorne past spades and turf fires, the smoke and th as thick and gray as water past the woman sweeping the hearth with a goose wing, cleaning the chimney with a gander. I ran past her drop scones, the wheaten bread. I ran past all I used to love, but can no longer entirely remember. You will remember, for we in our youth did these things. Yes, many and beautiful things. Um, So I'll just do two more. Uh, this is called The First Lament um, about Ceres. Um, you know the story probably of Persephone and, and Demeter. This is the Roman version, Ceres. Ceres understood. Transitions were not to be made alone. She accompanied girls as they stepped across each threshold into the softening approach of womanhood, the rounding of hip and haunch, the plumping of breast into a pliable form upon which a man or child could find solace. She oversaw each tentative move into married life, giving courage as she blessed the potential of the framework. She held each mother's hand and mopped each clear brow as the sweet small soul came forward and light through water broke over the world. Even the dead she cared for, shading them as they passed into the darkness. In her fields, the earth displayed her bounty. Grapes glistened in the sun, vines strengthened, wheat made the chafe seem purposeful. 
Sunflowers grew taller than the children who played among them. Was it her fertility that eventually incurred their wrath? Because her, flat, her pl plow furrow opened the earth to the realm of men and created the first field and its first boundary. She brought forth and she sheltered. When she sang, starlings circled the air. Cows looked up with moonstruck eyes. Torches from the spina alba burned brighter. Her justice was in the scent of the apple's white blossom. The refusal of the red-flowered hibiscus to feel shame. Um, this is the last one. It's called um, Cauchemar Nightmare. In the dream, you lay with your back to me, as if the promise of love, which shone in my features even from afar, had subsided. Your thoughts at once, at one time arrested by the body's form, were of other shapes and figures. Does it matter that they were inanimate? You who taught me newly to regard color, who led me by the hand into the cold sea, who sanctioned the night air we breathed into with song, the delicacy in our loving, do you remember? Through touch we were released. But what you keep near your desk are stones, pieces of wreckage. Can you press these against your cheek, turn them tenderly over in your hands? Do you think, when the kissing has ended, of the destruction of cities, of people under attack, what is one living face set against the memory of so many? Thank you. I have a question about uh, what you'll be doing over in Belfast as a part of your Fulbright work. Uh, what is your main uh, mission at this point? Well, it's to keep my 21-year-old under control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, other than that, um, I'll be teaching two poetry courses at Queen's University in Belfast and um, finishing a book on the Irish poet Michael Longley about ideas of community in, in Belfast, which, as you know, is a very fraught society even still. Um, I'll be giving readings, doing a couple talks, mostly taking care of my six-year-old son, who's in the corner here. My husband, well, he needs a little less taken care of, and my 21-year-old. Um, but I really hope I'm allowed to go do some of my research and writing while I'm there, too. So. Um, you know how it is with children. You have to, to shake yourself free of them on occasion to do, to do some kind of imaginative work. So I'm looking forward to it. It'll be a, a great six months, I think. Mm -hmm. Best wishes for that. Thanks, thanks. How long have you lived in Ireland? How long have I lived in Ireland? I've, I've never lived in Ireland, ever. It, that's an interesting question. You, you know, ever since I, I was a child, I, I loved poetry. And when I was a teenager, a teacher introduced me to a poem by Seamus Heaney called Bone Dreams. And when I read that poem, I felt my whole future open up before me. You know, each line that my eyes descended, it was as if someone was dropping a light into the rest of my life. And something about his wrestling with etymology, with the energies of words from different etymological origin clashing on the line. Um, I thought, you know, there's something about that Irish mentality which has suffered uh, uh, the effects of all sorts of kinds of conflict, religious, linguistic. Um, and I felt somehow akin to it. And I, I sent Seamus Heaney the first thing I wrote about him when I was a teenager, and he wrote back. And if that wasn't enough to make me totally fall head over heels in love with him and whatever he taught me. And, you know, when he died two years ago, it was, it was just excruciating. I felt like my father had died, you know, because I think my, my dad actually died 
right that year that I was first introduced to Heaney's poems. So he opened up to me world upon world. And um, somehow, you know, when I first went to Belfast, I thought, I'm related to all these people. You know, and my family does have Ulster Scots um, origin. But something about the sweetness, but also the ability to transcend suffering really appeals to me. And I think the Irish do a great job of that. They don't wallow in despair. They somehow have lift above it and keep making the most amazing art. One more. Yes. Um, can I have like a question about the first poem that you read? I think it was the first. You said, love is a direction and not a... That, that's Simon Vai. That was the second one then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, can you say that again? That Let me read Simon Vai. I don't want to do it incorrectly. Uh, Simone Vai wrote, and, and this is in her book, Waiting for God, it is only necessary to know that love is a direction, not a state of the soul. Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you. I'm not the type who looks forward to these things. The dressing up and leaving the warm womb of the house where all my needs seem fed by familiar darkness. I need to be pushed out into the too bright shock of words or surgically removed, cleaned up, and dressed in a gauze-colored frock. I am not the kind who can easily mingle, though the band stirring like trees sparkle in a sun-generous morning swayed me, so I stayed away from the crowd, near the corner, near exits, aware of every way out, the barless windows behind me, big enough to suddenly throw myself from, led to a rooftop fire escape that led to an alley, that led to a road. I watched and wondered if I could move from this spot past the people who were all lit up not from drugs or alcohol, but from something more certain, such as self-assurance, pass them to pour myself a little glass of punch. Or was this just a test? Was I suffering paralysis? Could I navigate the outskirts of the room? The way seemed clear enough, and though I felt like a caterpillar and didn't want punch and had to say hello to someone who I, Christ, knew once, I moved to a more social realm where twice I had to smile as if I knew how to work my lips. I am not like people who smile, dance, have fun in conversation, and in clothes not borrowed but right, as if made for them for the party, like wedding gowns made for brides. Not for me, for I was becoming a glass chandelier, hung high above everyone, aloof and glittering with crystal prisms of light that reflect a rainbow in blue sky until I looked down and panicked at my height, my fear of falling, and began to break out into a sweat and pressured self plea, oh, put me down, put me down, lower, lower I sank down, sunk so much like a sudden urge to smoke cigarettes or hide in the bathroom. Then I knew from the flushed match, smoke crawling toward the asthmatic detector glaring down its red eye, 
that my invitation was a mistake or obligation made to my parents long ago when they were kids thinking how hopeful to have children who'll stand around and make punch bowl conversations about families of their own successful, well-adjusted, part of the scene. The party got old and deflated, an empty room of streamers strewn along the next morning floor. And I remember I didn't want to go to the party, but little are we able to choose our fate the way I didn't choose this day, or to be writing about this party. And perhaps you were there too and we never met. We'll never have the chance to meet, but I think the way you read this with such knowing attention and dismissal both at the same time that we could easily be friends. But what I was thinking about was not a party, but a cemetery of Saturday nights buried between us and how wrong I have been to have chosen such deep love for this world that I will someday leave, this world that I'm slowly growing into and saying goodbye to at the same time. Yeah.